that's um, I created a band to like so I'll just all different kinds of things. I used to be a makeup artist. Um, my particular industry for makeup was runway high fashion and hip hop music videos specifically um, because clearly I'm a hip hop fan and <laughs> it was just so much fun. Um, and what inspires all of my work, and I also work in tech, and I believe that creating uh, technology is a form of art because coming from an artist's way of thinking, that's where you could be innovative to think about how we create things. But I'm inspired by nature and the flow of energy and how the universe works. Um, I believe that I, I do things like I'll stare at a tree for like an hour. It's so pretty right now. They are so pretty right now. But there's so much inspiration that comes from that or spending my mornings near the ocean or just like seeing how snails slide around or garden snakes and things. And I won't paint snakes at all. Yeah. It just, but it's an inspiration of how like God's creation comes together. So that's my work. And I, I would say I'm a photographer, but like I just keep everything to myself. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I release the book, then I say I'm a photographer. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna just uh, throw out some questions here, and anyone can answer them if they want to. Um, I'm not gonna call anyone. This is not law school. <laughs> so um, a lot of you are wearing so many different hats. Um, so tell us how, tell us about your creative practice and how you find time to actually create. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to share. Um, since I do so many different things, there's different practices to begin. For if we say like starting with my art, nowadays it's like if someone's like, hey, can you create this piece of something? Then I'll create. But generally, my process for art is like when I'm feeling like my container has hit, like, mm -hmm. I know that there's a release for me. So I'll go through the process of like, I like to paint on the floor as well. I don't paint standing up. I need to be down on the ground like a oh, kid. Wow. Always, always on the ground. I try to do the standing up thing. It's weird. Um, <laughs> I've been painting so long, like, on the ground. I have to do it this way. But I'll sit there, I'll play a playlist or whatever it is that I need to do to get myself in that channel mm -hmm. to release. The sec the, there's a process after that though. Once the painting is done, I only paint in one se setting, I don't come back. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's not done, that's it. Oh, because wow. I'm releasing the ball. I'm oh, wow. being a channel. You can't, mm -hmm. for me, I can't be a channel saying come back next week and be like, so? It doesn't work. <laughs> um, but it gives me a perspective of like, I'll take a step back after to take a check-in on myself. So I know that if I'm using lots of really dark hues, even though I believe black does not count as a dark color, that's a whole nother conversation for a different day. But if I notice that there's really dark hues and things happening, like I'll take a second to check in on that. Um, and then when it comes to like my production and other stuff, honestly, I don't really have a process. I mean, there's a few things. I'm like space, vibes, people, food. If those yes. things are there, then it's natural. And then I get, Will can tell you, there's not much direction once we get there. I'm like, this is what you can't do. <laughs> Have a blast. And, but, but that is beauty for me because I've been able to create a space that can cultivate art amongst people. And again, that's that energy. And then it's like, you don't know what is created. If there's too many barriers, the artist themselves cannot channel what it is that they need to do, then usually I'll just like hide in the corner and paint or just like sit and not speak for two hours until everybody's done. But that's my process. Um, same for tech, if I get an idea, because I'm neurodivergent, I'll just, it's all or nothing. It's like, <laughs> it's now, these next five hours don't talk to me, I'm calling everybody, we're moving a thousand miles a minute, and then there's times where I don't talk for like two days. So that's just, I guess that's my process. <laughs> no problem. It's a whole process. Oh, um, I mean, my art practice, because I'm very new to using that title, I similarly am not very comfortable referring to myself as a writer. Because for me, personally, a lot of the things that become titles um, around me in professional or creative contexts are just things that I do. Mm -hmm. I write because my career has only ever been in media, and I was a beat journalist, and I write articles for magazines. But when it comes to art, um, I would say that my first art experience was in movement. I was a ballerina for 10 years and traveled.
childhood. And uh, my departure from dance was actually, still is a big part of my life to this day. I think being an ex-ballerina informed me a lot more even than when I was a ballerina, because as a child, it informs the way I do my body and other bodies, it informs the way I put standards of beauty and excellence and precision. And that is kind of indicative of the way that I view myself, but also just like the all or nothing where these titles are concerned. So when I was not a dancer anymore, I couldn't find anything yet, it took a while, but like that I felt like was accurate to what I do. I don't paint, I don't draw, I've never, and it was funny because I've always only had creative friends. I've always wanted to go to art school. It was not something that was encouraged in my family. So what ended up happening for me, I would say I was just like a habitual e-girl. I spent a lot of time online on just websites that were comfortable for me as a source of like community. I was a Tumblr kid, I was a Jacqueline kid. I love like I love the imagery of like dot com. I love being like someone who grew up in the early two thousands and got to see all these like clunky interfaces. A lot of them don't even work anymore. And it's like it's so interesting. There's a lot of really cool artists now. Um, I want to say Chloe Shetta Poe, I'm probably getting her last name correct, but a Philly-based um, quilt artist, um, textile artist, who replicates dot-com digital interfaces on the quilts. Um, she's very, she's excellent. She's currently showing the Brooklyn Museum as part of um, Swiss Beats and Alicia Keys' um, mm -hmm. private collection. But art like that, in the world of collage, of digital imagery, is I would say what I do artistically. Um, I took a my first art class in adulthood very recently, and it was a zine making class. Um, my passion, passion outside of my own art is printed physical media and magazines. I collected magazines. I have like a stack of jet magazines in my home. Uh, like the <laughs> collected, and it's like and watching a big part of my professional like training before I knew what I wanted to do was seeing how these incredible historic brands have like risen and fallen. Mm -hmm. And I worked for a black, well I worked with different magazines, but seeing the way that the, the physical uh, like magazine place is very tenuous has brought me back to this digital imagery space. So I still have to say, I make collages on my phone. Um, I, use, I use different apps, like I use like, and not anything fancy, I'm not very good at the Adobe Suite, I use like, like things that I think are honestly meant for children. Um, there's an app called Shuffles. I use another one called like Collage Maker. Just just anything. I was like, well, I don't know how an artist would do this, but I want this picture next to this picture, inside this picture. And then, and once I found, I did find one app eventually that does allow me to do this um, portrait format that I really prefer. I've been making them nonstop for two years, and I just keep them in a little private collection. And I didn't share them until that art class. Highly recommend the space. It's like a new YMCA hybrid multi space. It is privately owned though um, in Chinatown mm -hmm. called Index Space. Mm -hmm. where it's really great. They do a lot of different classes, and I just signed up for the class. And they taught the fundamentals and political background of zine making, um, and taught us how to make a zine. And I was, I think, one of the only people who didn't know how to use. Um, whichever Adobe software they were encouraging us to use, and I just asked if I could just take the JPEGs from the Shuffles app and put them into a book, and that's what my book became. So, um, yeah, I think that really informs just like what I want in general. If I am to enter a curatorial space, I believe in art made by non-artists, mm -hmm. and design in particular, that I think veers into the design hybridity. Um, but on my phone, I do it when I'm stressed. I do them on the train very often. And just like when I know it's like about to bubble over, I'm like, please make a collage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's done for me. Listen, yeah. Um, um hmm. important question. I, so I'm a martial artist, mm -hmm. and I teach martial arts and yoga, but I've been doing martial arts for 18 years. Mm -hmm. So from most of the thinking, a lot. So we were just having this conversation, but I'd say martial arts is definitely the medium I use that keeps me balanced. Um, martial arts is my first love, mm -hmm. um, the deepest love in my life is, mm -hmm. is martial arts. Um, martial arts made me the person I am today. And so that like, 
feeling the label of martial artist feels very comfortable. And now, you know, similarly, I've always had friends who were artists, but I was too afraid to claim myself as one. So I was a curator instead, um, which, no shit. But, you know, like, I, I did that because I was too afraid to make my own art. So I made my art out of other people's art, um, which is fun. But now, kind of stepping into the space of being a sculptor mm -hmm. and claiming that, because I'm a carpenter by trade, that's how I pay my rent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of stepping into the space of of being a sculptor and claiming myself a sculptor is very difficult for me. I'm not gonna lie, my process, I, I don't have a, a process that's straightforward. I, I'm still pretty much fumbling through, figuring out what that means for me. Um, and frankly, making, even talking about it, I'm scary, but making art is scary to me, you know? I can, what I'll do is I, I make knives out of wood. So I will batch make a certain process of my knives and then not touch 20 of them for like a year. And then it's just like, okay, at some point you gotta finish this. But um, it's scary. And I, I'll say my process is really me fighting myself um, a lot of the time. And just, you know, allowing myself to be vulnerable enough with myself to not be a perfectionist because that is just setting yourself up to fail. Um, so I've been, I don't have a, a proper answer to that. My answer is that I'm struggling. Um, to have a process and um, and uh, and trust myself enough to fail, mm -hmm. you know, because that's that's uh, it's hard, especially because in the type of martial art that I do, it's very applicable to other types of martial arts. So for the most part, like I do Muay Thai, it's a kickboxing style, if I should say, from Thailand. Yeah. The art of eight limbs. Um, it's a street fighting style. Yeah. So it. It kind of applies relatively well to a lot of other types of martial arts. However, I started doing capoeira recently, which is like, like it's completely different. My brain didn't even know how to operate in capoeira world, and it was uncomfortable because I'm used to just 18 years. I step into a martial arts gym, I'm gonna be good, like regardless of what it is. Um, but TBH. Um, but capoeira was different, and I was like, damn it. It feels good to fail at something because I have something to to look toward and you know I have something to work on. It doesn't come easy. I'm kind of you know it sounds a little cocky, but I'm accustomed to things coming a little easy to me. Um, and so when they don't, I get very uncomfortable. Mm. And I think that's what being an artist is about. Not things it not being easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm fumbling through that process. Have a process. My process is failing. Um, continuing to fail is my process, and, um, and being more comfortable with failure every day. So. The journey is the destination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the process is the journey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it sucks, but but it is what it is. Um, and I'm, I'm learning to like it. Hello. Um, thank you. I feel like I don't feel like resonate and I think I'm trying to embrace the failures more often. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, a lot of my creative process is discipline um, when it comes to the magazine. Obviously I like, have to be active. I have to put out content. Um, and again like wearing so many hats, if I'm not going to an event and the pictures are not being taken, nothing is moving or happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess like from a personal creative process perspective, I think, like I said, like life, sometimes things feel like a little bit too slow. So it's like, I need something to happen. Cause I think I resonate with what you had shared earlier of like, just, a, I'm really heavily a people watcher. Just seeing things happen around me. And for example, whether it's a snail and like, maybe I come up with some type of concept. I don't know, the way my brain works is like, let's say we're doing a snail, I'm like, Wow, like they're so slow, but they're getting to where they're going, and that just turns into like that this whole that was a whole yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it turns into like this whole concept in my mind, and I can see it. But I think with being a perfectionist, I think I scare myself out of like you know. I feel like I'm not the full potential to really create this image how it is exactly in my head. So. It just kind of unmotivates me. Yeah. So I think, um, and I was reading this book, um, and I'll find the title and share with everyone later if you're interested. But this is kind of about 
when the universe sends you an idea, mm -hmm. it's for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Like it's meant to, even if it's not, you're not able, like literally able to release it within that moment. Mm -hmm. Writing mm -hmm. it down, recording it, making that bed, the treatment, those are all part of the process mm -hmm. into bringing it into fruition. So I think for me, you know, discipline and is part of the process with the magazine. But I think for like personal creative pro projects, I'm still trying to figure out like the balance and just not be, giving myself grace, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, and really making those steps into just making it happen. Because if not now, then when? Yeah. As you guys are talking, I, I, I thought of this. Um, as a person of color, how do you, um, if you ever have dealt with um, imposter syndrome, and have you, or have you worked through, through it? Can I ask for clarity in your question? Mm -hmm. Is it imposter syndrome as a person of color, or imposter syndrome? Exactly. Let's expand it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so how you could choose to answer it as this is how I've dealt with it as a person of color, or this is how I've just dealt with imposter syndrome in my life. You don't have to answer. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if I need to add. Yeah, um, I'm a martial artist and a carpenter, and I look like this. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I, for me, I know that that makes sense because I'm doing it. But it's more people in, imposing on me that I'm an imposter mm -hmm. than me being like, I'm an imposter. Um, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, but I don't know. But yeah, I feel like the most on the internal, the imposter syndrome has definitely been with claiming myself as an artist yeah. as well. That's something I internally deal with um, and struggle through every day. But externally, it's, it's often people being like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, come let me beat your ass. <laughs> 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 um, I will show you exactly what I'm doing. Um, so it's just a bit of a mixed bag. I love, like, I'm working on getting into a union as a carpenter. Yeah. Oh, insurance. Yeah. One day. One day, the promised land, I'll see it. Um, but, um, you know, I'm in a space where I'm interested in being a foreman. So I can be like, oh, well, who are you? And I'm like, hmm, go home. That's why. Um, and I know I have to still do that. So, so, you know, that, that's how I deal with it on the external. Just, I, I, I don't have to tell you, I'm going to show you. Um, that's it. And you're going to have to deal with all of that you do, all the projection. That's a you problem, baby. It's not a me problem. And it's, you know, with martial arts, since I started so young, it's easy to be like, mm, that's a new problem. As a carpenter, because I started, that's like my third career, really. Because um, I was doing curatorial work, and I worked in nonprofits, and I worked in the art world, and fashion, and all this shit. I've been there. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, get into that space. At first, I was like, am I good enough to do this? Yeah. And then I'm looking, I'm like, you don't even know how to hold a drill. Yes, I'm good enough to do this. Everybody get out of my face. <laughs> um, I bet. So uh, that helps, just shown by action. And then on the internal side, it, it's a bitch. It's being like, I'm an artist because I show up every day, or I attempt to. I don't show up every day. I wish I did. Um, I'm working on showing up every day for myself that way. But um, I attempt to show up every day in that authenticity. Um, so that's how I'm fighting that internal process. But it's, it's got me in the corner. It's got to be my ass. But I'm in, I'm in the fight, coach. This <laughs> <laughs> is not easy. Um, <laughs> I'm already really excited based on what you said about like fighting it. That's not, it's not always my strong suit. Um, I'm very, I think every, I really think that every person of color, especially if you're a woman, 
um, is is like really well versed in some form of imposter syndrome, just how like I don't know, connections of power work. Um, I got used to it. I think we all have some maybe form of childhood experience with it, and just realizing that this is something that other people are going to put on you. It's an offensive of people who don't. Um, and I grew up in a neighborhood where there were not families like mine, um, a, a very deeply rooted white suburb. And um, despite you know what I knew to be true, and my family knew to be true about things that really weren't even anybody else's business about how and why we lived where we did, um, there's a constant facing of people who um, want to put you in a different box or are making assumptions about who you are and what your values are. And it's honestly. I think because I won't do I won't give my parents the total credit because <laughs> they are people of a certain generation. So even though I think I was raised in a very particular way to push back um, psychologically against that type of thinking, and they did do a great job in helping me ground ground myself in that. Um, my circumstances were different. You know, my being told that I was like not smart enough to be a class in a class or like not. Like, you know, the way that we navigate desirability politics and very racialized and like, and even just just meritocracy is meant to like make black people believe that they don't belong. And over and over and over again, I've existed in those spaces. And I'm not gonna say I don't care, but I actually have, it might be one of my few delights, because it's like, I'm here to have sex. If I'm not supposed to be here, um, and then I had like, a really great lady going to um, an all women's HBCU where imposter syndrome doesn't go away. I think even in groups where it's like just us and all people of color and in places where you're grounded in ideals of liberation, there's always going to be somebody telling you that you are and aren't based on, again, their assumptions as someone who does not know you. Um, and I just, it's constantly evolving. Like, I think I have a lot of fun with it. It's something that I put into my collages now. Because um, I learned overwhelmingly that feeling does not result in me leaving that space. Um, where it does, it is something I am trying to advance my confrontation with is professionally. I have only ever worked in media at a professional level, media and politics to an extent. And these are spaces that the further in I go, I do maintain this optimism that it gets better, but the deeper in I go, the more I realize how entrenched mm -hmm. um, power dynamics are. And the power elite just morphs and morphs in more insidious ways. Yes. I work with a lot of people who frankly don't need to work, who are mm -hmm. part of very old, wealthy families that I know, you know, I don't know anything about that life. And I carry knowing that I am different from these folks while also recognizing the immense amount of privilege that I possess that would bring me there in the first place over somebody else. Mm -hmm. And um, that's complicated because it's almost a combination of survivor's guilt and imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But all I can, I'm getting better um, at this phase of my adulthood and realizing that like, I can only kind of worry about me. I can only try to, it sounds cliche, but I do believe in lifting as we climb. Um, I'm an editor. I'm not a very powerful editor, but I have, this is the first time in my career I've been able to put people on at an institutional level, and that's all I've ever wanted. I want the right people to get opportunities. I got very lucky with editorial opportunities very early. I was 19 when I got my biggest byline to date, and it completely directed my career into writing. I don't even think I would have wanted to be a writer if I had not been published in the platform that I'd been at that time and at that age. But I, know, I now know that it's possible. And the further in I go and see who these peers are, when I'm like, oh, it was always possible. And a lot of people aren't even that great. <laughs> 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 I think that's what I like about the curatorial world. It's so subjective. Right. You're literally just trying to impress the right person to like denote value to you, which is insane, actually. But it's like, literally. <laughs> and it's like, well, I mean, if I have the privilege of being able to speak the language, I'm going to use it to put on people that I think are excellent. Mm -hmm. Not like the same network mm -hmm. you use for lack of better words, you can get a lot of the opportunities mm -hmm. anyway. And don't leave them. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I feel like imposter syndrome, it's hard. I think a lot of 
for me, you know, when I feel like I am able to play it off a little bit, is really faith and just feeling like there has to be a reason why this passion was instilled in me. There has to be a reason why I've been able to do what I do. Um, I think also just reassurance from other people sometimes. You know, it's not, Gambit is not like the biggest platform or anything like that, but just seeing other people want to use Gambit as a vehicle to tell their stories for me is more than enough, whether it's one person, two people. And I think even just, I feel like, okay, in the, especially like in the media world, in the fashion world, just seeing how
I walked on. Um, my first my first major was mass communications. I wanted to have my own television show. Uh, my second major, then I had a 4.0 and I was like, I'm really gonna piss off this degree if I just keep getting straight. It's like, I'm way too smart to be doing this. So I need to be challenged. Um, and that's the theme of my life, it's like I need to be challenged. So from there, I ended up studying pre-med because I thought I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. I didn't like the idea of white men working on women's bodies. It just really pissed me off. So I was like, how do I change that? I'm just gonna be myself. Then got to chemistry, chemistry and I didn't have any chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I got a B and it wasn't for nothing. Um, I'm like, again, perfectionist, so what is that? Um, and I think that's when the imposter sy syndrome began. And that, again, that's before mm -hmm. There was this whole inundated definition of what imposter syndrome was. I just didn't feel like I was as good as my peers. Mm -hmm. And based on that idea, I was not. So I changed my major and I moved into politics and philosophy of political regimes because I love to see the way that regimes come together and designate how a society works. Because mm -hmm. I believe that like I'll have my own country one day for mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to understand the regimes. Um, and in that space, I didn't have too much imposter syndrome. Then I went and got my master's degree. You can't tell, I'm trying to pull up when it came. Um, then I got my MBA, blah, blah, blah. I'm always so used to being the youngest person, top of my class. I don't really care about anyone else, if they're a second or third, I don't care. I'm just doing what I can. God gave me the gift of smart, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Like, there was that issue. Now, my imposter syndrome didn't really begin. Honestly, I was saying to like two years ago, mm -hmm. when imposter syndrome became a word for our society, um, I started feeling success guilt. Mm -hmm. I started feeling imposter syndrome in the space of how can I be so young and so talented? And then the thing that really got me in the way I'm, what I'm working through now is that the things that I've been able to accomplish in 30 years, I'm 30. I'm, I'm one of those women who I would tell you how old I am. <laughs> anyway, but um, I've accomplished so much in 30 years, 10 years really, that people have taken whole lifetimes to do, and I just decided to do it. And the spaces that I'm in, it's like, okay, well, I just want to produce events, and then I'm like producing events with like math producers, and that's just how my life flows. So the imposter syndrome started to become a thing over the last two years of feeling undeserving for the placements that I'm in. It's almost a shock of how the hell did I get here? Mm -hmm. um, it caused panic attacks, so way of dealing with it. It caused panic attacks, depression, all types of things. Doing much better now. Um, but now that I've taken time to slow down and be with the nature, imposter mm -hmm. syndrome is unnecessary. Because, first of all, we're on a panel, but I'm just gonna say, who gives a fuck about anyone else's opinion? Right. Mm -hmm. Tamar was not promised. Okay. Like, why is anyone else's opinion of what I can do or create? Mm -hmm. How is that? Why Why do I feel like I need to be in the corner boxing in? Because imposter syndrome has its dudes up. But let me say, I'm, I'm stronger. Yeah. So we're gonna fight. Um, so I would say like now when I deal with it coming up, I'll take a moment, I'll go do breath work, and I'm just like, whose narrative is this? Is this yours or someone else? That's and then I sit with doing. that. And then another thing that maybe comes from my tech work is like, I'll break down things down, I'll break it down if I'm feeling like an imposter to the very granular level that I can. Stop making it a monster. Break it down to the smallest piece of salt. What is actually happening? Like I was feeling like an imposter like 10 minutes ago, sitting right here. I don't know why. My heart's all like beating and stuff. And I'm like, girl, you sit on a panel with you in the room. Around art. Right? What's wrong with you? It is in the way. But I, I have to bring it down to what are we doing? I'm in a room with people that look like me. We're fine. Like, right? And sometimes that's how I deal with it. What's it here for you? Yeah, exactly. And if I don't, God gave me a gift to share, how dare I disrespect him and be an imposter? Yeah. So it's, again, I work through my imposter syndrome through all of those things now to say I'm deserving and if I am there, I was meant to be there. But I break it down to the smallest piece of salt I can. Not ruminate, bring it down to the most granular level I can. What is actually happening? Not the story that I'm giving myself. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm navigating it. I honestly don't really care what other people think right now. 
which is a good space to be. So we hope that uh, we stay there. But one of my goals within the world of the Apostle Syndrome is that we eradicate the word because it's just unnecessary. And I feel like once we had the word, the phrase and definition, everyone just had imposter syndrome all of a sudden. Like, stop diagnosing ourselves with that. For what? Just create. Our ancestors were just creative. They were just, maybe they did. But they didn't call it an imposter syndrome. I feel like we have a problem in today's time where we have to give. That is not the question. I'm sorry. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but like I, feel, I feel like we have this problem with everything needs to have a title and a definition. And it's like some things just are. There's no end to that sentence. Some things just are. Yeah. Now I'm getting fired up because I can't. It's something I've been sitting with lately. Now I moved back home to Connecticut with my family just to like calm down from. New York was great. I had a substantial amount of success. But I realized that, again, what gives imposter syndrome for me is that I was giving the end destination, the definition of success. And if I didn't reach the destination that I felt like I should have reached, I felt like, oh, I wasn't successful. No, the journey is success. I should. The journey is the destination. There's no imposter syndrome you on the journey. Just be on the journey. But I'm so over this society. These poor kids. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I do, unfortunately. I have, we were talking earlier about people pleasing. I have the illness where I care a lot about what other people think. Just because that's how I was raised. I was raised to perfect the, like, self-optimize so you can receive the things that you need. Because I kind of conceptualize my safety through how I can move in the world by being, um, by proving that I'm deserving of the things. Mm. And that's a lifelong project. That that's I'm painful. Doing. It's horrible. And I have my own journeys through that. But it's just like, I think what's been most freeing in the last, I would say definitely since I've moved to New York too, um, being more discerning about identifying like who is my people. Because like I am learning to care less about if people don't clap if I don't respect them. Um, and mm, like, that's the one. just like, I don't know. Also, like, if you do decide that you want to internalize the messages that you're receiving about yourself, I personally learned that I can't help it. I have a lot of women in my life that are more of the school of like, well, don't engage, don't listen to it. I wish I could do that. I can't. Um, and it makes me feel very anxious and uncomfortable and unhappy in my body. Mm -hmm. But it's, I think the ways that we can mitigate, like realistically practical ways, muting accounts, muting the things you see, making sure you don't engage as much with certain veneers, because certain things are avoid, like unavoidable. I think the reason also I say this is like partially because of this like theater, dance, background, even the title muses, I have a very complicated relationship with the term muse. Because, yeah, it's like the way that I've often heard it used is from men to women and mm -hmm. to models. Mm -hmm. And I've always had model friends. I don't know if any of you have like been to castings or know that well, but that's a very, very, yeah, very negative space mm -hmm. to have like your body and your likeness and your face be scrutinized by people who don't know you and they're doing it for money and they're doing it for money that you're not getting and they're doing it for like money to promote things that are perpetuating ideas about your face, body, and likeness that are damaging to everybody. Um, Especially the people making things. It's horrible. It's, like, it's like, very meta. Planet, it's very meta. There are a lot of women in particular, I think, who occupy those spaces because of necessity. Mm -hmm. um, and interrogating like, those politics around that have made me, have, have, have helped a lot with my experience of like imposter syndrome. People call me ugly. People say that like, people, right? <laughs> <laughs> saying that like, your work is bad, saying that you are ugly, saying that you are like not smart. Like these are like, we all say things, I have a mouth on me. These are like things that are projected and be, depending on who says them, we, we people like me who internalize, um, carry it more than we need to because of the mouth that it's coming from. 
and me being in the industry I am, getting closer and realizing that a lot of these voices are people that I do not respect. Mm -hmm. Working in really high fashion magazines that are saying in meetings that a black person who, if they were not black, a person of color, that if they were not a brown person who is killing it in their field or killing it in like every way that should make them worthy to be in a spread in a cover. Hearing people of high status in these fields of aesthetic like governance say that those people are off brand Mm -hmm. with no justification. There is no way that they're saying it for anything that has any actual artistic or curatorial merit. They are just bigoted. Right. And the like, brand is quite smart. The brand is quite smart. Oh, no, no. That's, and that's like, ballet is an extension of that. Ballet is a highly white supremacist mm -hmm. smart sport that is meant to make black and brown bodies feel like they're unworthy. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why you are told that you are not meant to dance professionally if you have hips, if you have butt, if you're not right in the place. Like, these are things, mm -hmm. and, you know? And it's like, thank God we have institutions that challenge that. That's why I'm kind of like a black and brown art nationalist, I would say. There needs to be mm -hmm. own, because in integrated space within these fields, there is still a lot of power concentrated among people who will just say that something is bad just because it doesn't fit their idea of success. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of those people don't have any sense of racial education or nuance, so they don't even recognize how they're perpetuating really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, in a perfect world, everybody learns. Um, in a perfect world, like we all get that education, but until that happens, it's just like, turn it off, disengage. I, don't, I follow a lot of um, magazines, like artsy magazines that like are helpful as a writer to like get certain work out there. They're very good for young writers, young photographers, but they're all run by rich white kids who mm -hmm. have terrible taste. Terrible taste? Oh my god. No taste. Because taste is subjective. Right? Taste is subjective. They have a taste that is not fitting to me. They have a taste that I disagree with. Um, also we're in a recession and I do have a friend, I have a lot of friends who share that like, it's kind of a joke, but in recessions, um, skinniness and uh, whiteness and like very like hegemonic notions of beauty come back into style because right. it's cheap to replicate. Sure. So mm -hmm. like, wow. That's the word. Wow. 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 Thank you.